Sigue en sintonía de nuestra programación. Está empezando el show del doctor Roy Aranda, donde abordaremos temas sobre separación niños de padres, casos de violencia, traumas con los indocumentados, cómo resistir ante tiempos de pandemias. Llámanos en vivo al 1-888-900-2811, extensión 6, y haz tus propias preguntas al aire. ¡Comenzamos! Hello. Good evening, my dear Tribuna TV viewers. Buenas noches, queridos televidentes de el famosísimo programa Tribuna TV. Um, so here we are today, October 28, hoy es October 28, and we have another another show for you today. And I have um, I have a very special guest. I have a, a, a guest who uh, is, is quite distinguished in his accomplishments. He's done a lot in his career. And uh, I'll share a little bit about it with you momentarily. Uh, I did want to mention uh, his name. He's Dr. Joel DeVoskin. And uh, we also have, l l last time, last show, I forgot about poor Oscar, so <laughs> I'm not forgetting him today. Uh, Oscar, Oscar Luna, he's the TV producer, and he's certainly part of my, part of my team. Don Oscar quiere saludar a la gente. Oh my God! It's another another rainy, cold day in New York. I don't know what's going on in New York. You you did you did good, Joel, disappearing, taking off. the the main The main problem for me when we have this rain and all of that is, is that uh, we we lose power, <laughs> and that certainly affects the production of the show when that happens. Uh, so hopefully we won't. And um, every 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 show, I always ask Oscar if he can. If you can provide, if you can provide us with some proposals, but I, I never, I, I've never succeeded in getting the proposals yet. Maybe one of these days. Um, at any rate, uh, I did want to share that the, the name of the show today is Improving Police Community Relations, Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement. Okay, so it's sort of a complicated <laughs> title. But the, the gist of it really is to improve relations so that, you know, so the cops um, provide a better, safer uh, service to the public. And I'm also going to include a couple of pointers for the viewers uh, in terms of improving their relationships with police through police community relations and also um, improving on those occasions that they might have an encounter with the police officer either either on the street or, or through a traffic stop um let me just tell the viewers that as usual the program is being recorded live so presently it's being recorded on youtube by tomorrow there will be a recording the recording will be on youtube on tribuna tv's um website on on vmail and other other uh, platforms as well you, we, we do have slides, as usual. I have several slides that we will be using. And uh, I encourage the viewers to either take a photograph of the slide while the show is on or wait until the uh, recording is up and then you can just take screenshots at your leisure. So um, that said, let me, let me start pretty much by introducing the topic for today. Me puede poner, Oscar, por favor, slide one. So uh, here you see the name, and you see my guest, uh, Dr. Joel DeVoskin, PhD, and he has a very, very high uh, uh, a credential after that. He's board certified. And Joel DeVoskin, he is the former acting commissioner of mental health for the state of New York, uh, and the show will focus on research aimed to prevent police misconduct, avoid police mistakes, and improve police community relations. Uh, as a consultant to the New Orleans Police Department, Joel helped to develop the EPIC, Ethical Policing is Courageous, program that has become a national model for 
Police Reform in the United States. He's also on the National Board of Advisors for Project ABLE, which he will talk about, which stands for Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement, part of Georgetown University Law School Innovative Policing Project. Um, I'm dedicating this show to law enforcement officers because um, they certainly work hard to safeguard society and to the public, the public who recognizes or needs to recognize the importance of maintaining healthy interactions with police and enhancing police community relations. Pues de sacar el primer slide. So, um, Joel, I'm going to, I just wanted to introduce you uh, briefly, but um, I, I have your bio. I'm going to ask Oscar in a moment to put the bio up. I won't read it because it's very long. <laughs> I'll just say a couple of words. Uh, but basically, I did want to let the, uh, the viewers know how, how I met him. I met Joel in 1985. He was then the director, uh, what was it, the director of for forensic services or something like that? I forgot the exact title, yeah, but I, I know so. you were it. You were, you were the top dog for, uh, for forensic services in New York. And there was uh, one of the hospitals of Manhattan Psychiatric Center, the Kirby, the smaller of the three buildings, was uh, fitted and converted into a forensic psychiatric hospital. The other two buildings continued as Manhattan Psychiatric Center, and the purpose of Kirby Forensic Psychiatric Center was to harbor uh, patients with psychiatric problems who also had criminal legal problems. They either were having difficulty proceeding with their criminal trials because they were uh, mentally incapable, incompetent of doing so, the purpose of the hospitalization was to help them to restore that. Uh, and we also had patients who were there who had been acquitted as a result of an insanity defense plea that was successful. And they were there for treatment in order to help them um, reach a point that society or that the courts could deem that they were no longer dangerously mentally ill and could be in some way uh, capable of getting back out to society in some way. So um, I met Joel in 1985. They were uh, at, at Kirby. They were looking to fill positions. And I had applied to become a treatment team leader. And I remember I met, I met him, and <laughs> I thought we hit it off pretty quickly. Uh, it must have been because he hired me. So <laughs> he was my boss. So my hat's off to you. And uh, I don't forget that. And we had some interesting experiences since then. Uh, I also teach psychology at John Jay uh, College for um, Criminal Justice, and Joel uh, delighted me by being a presenter. He was a, an expert guest at one of my classes recently. So, Oscar, por favor, el segundo slide. Okay, so as you can see, um, I, I had to squeeze a lot in there, Joel, <laughs> so I'm going to pretty much leave it up to you. But basically, um, just uh, to be to be brief, uh, you know, I already gave a little bit of your background. You're licensed in Arizona and New Mexico. You're certified in forensic psychology by the American Board of Professional Psychology. Uh, you've been very active, chair of the Governor's Advisory Council on Behavioral Health and Wellness for Nevada. You were former acting commissioner of mental health for the state of New York. Um, I'm going to leave the slide up for the uh, viewers who may want to take a photograph because there's really a wealth of information here. And I'm not trying in any way uh, to cut it too short, Joel, but if I read the whole thing, the arrow will be up. No, so, no I know that he has a private practice. He's a consultant. Uh, he does teaching and, and he's written. He's published a lot. Most significantly for this particular show is his involvement in researching and creating programs to really work with police departments to help them become more efficient and to help um, to help them be safer, safer and, and more uh, more efficacious and more 
um, less prone to having problems <laughs> in the work that they do. I thought I sort of think I summarized a little bit. So, Joel, take it away, please. Uh, add, add anything <laughs> that you think I may have missed and greet the viewers and we'll get started. Well, thank you for having me, Roy, and thanks to all the folks that are watching for your interest. Um, so what uh, Dr. Arand asked me to talk about was this program called ABLE. Um, I'm just a, a small part of it. Um, a lot of ABLE is based on the work of a psychologist by the name of Irvin Staub. And Dr. Staub was... Um, he's my dear friend and, and a wonderful psychologist. He runs the Peace Psychology Program or has been at, at the UMass Amherst. Um, and I think he's retired now, but still writing and working. And Dr. Staub uh, has been interested in bystandership for a very long time probably since he was a little kid because he, he he survived the Holocaust largely through the intervention of an active bystander, somebody who stepped forward to help him and other members of his family survive uh, during a time when people there was great peril in Hungary. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so after Rodney King... Uh, was beaten in Los Angeles, there was a lot of hoopla about police misconduct. And Dr. Staub designed a program to teach police officers in Los Angeles how to intervene, how to be active bystanders with each other, and to prevent wrongdoing, prevent misconduct, prevent mistakes. So unfortunately, to my knowledge, LAPD did not implement the program that Dr. Staub had designed for them, and it kind of just sat on a shelf for a while. So fast forward to around 2012, 2013, the New Orleans Police Department uh, was had a reputation as being a troubled police department. Um, certainly there were some serious examples of misconduct. Um, uh, I think 20, almost 20 officers, former officers from NOPD, New Orleans Police Department, had been uh, uh, imprisoned. One was on death row. <clears throat> and there were a lot of complaints about human, about civil rights violations by the New Orleans Police Department. The federal government, Department of Justice, came in and did what's called an investigation of them. And, and uh, it's a pretty heavy-duty investigation. And they their findings showed that there were or alleged that there were serious violations of civil rights in New Orleans by the police department. So the, the, the city of New Orleans negotiated with the Department of Justice and gave, they came up with a consent decree, as often happens with police departments, prisons, psychiatric hospitals, to make some changes. And interestingly, one line of the consent decree talked about teaching ethics to police officers. So... There was an attorney in New Orleans, or is an attorney in New Orleans, a civil rights attorney named Mary Howell. And Mary saw that line in the consent decree and decided that she was going to try to run with it. So she called Dr. Staub, whose book she had read, called me, and then put together a bunch of folks, a lot of New Orleans police officers and leaders of the department, Dr. Staub, myself, some other, some community organizers, and said, we can do better than just teaching an ethics course. We can really make it real and relevant to policing in America. So this group got together, and it was mostly run by the city of New Orleans Police Department. Um, I think we helped a little bit. Dr. Staub certainly helped a lot. I hope I helped a little bit. And we came up with a, with a curriculum 
that basically taught officers that the ethical thing to do was to step forward. So if you were a police officer, historically, and another officer did something wrong, you had two choices, and they were both horrible. You could lie about it and say you didn't see anything or be silent, which is a violation of policy. It's a violation of legal duty, and sometimes it's, a, it's a, actually a crime. That's a bad choice. But the other choice was to report it and be labeled a snitch or a rat and be ostracized by other officers. Well, why in the world would you ever want to put somebody in a position where both of their choices were horrible? So basically what we were saying, this group of people that put together a curriculum said, well, what if there was a third choice? What if the bad thing never happened? What if there was nothing to report? Because one officer stepped forward and decided to intervene and be an active bystander with the other officer so that the misconduct didn't occur, so that a mistake wouldn't occur. And so started a program called EPIC, which Dr. Aranda mentioned a few minutes ago, Ethical Policing is Courageous. And it was done by police, with police, and for police. It wasn't done to police. It wasn't done at police. And because of that, I think it was better received. We, there were some really excellent trainers that were just NOPD officers who learned the curriculum and began to teach it. And it took a while. But over the course of the first year, the federal court monitor, whose name is Jonathan Arany, and has kind of in many ways been the sort of guiding light of this project for a long time, started hearing stories about officers epicking each other. In other words, turning epic from a noun into a verb. I'm going to epic you. You're going to epic me. I'm going to accept it when you epic me. Meaning you're going to intervene. You're going to be an active bystander and say, hey, Joel, do you really want to do this? And over the course of the next couple of years, the culture of the New Orleans Police Department started to change. Now, to be fair, there were lots of things going on at the same time. The consent decree had a lot of pieces to it. But the people in the department really believe that EPIC played a huge role in changing the culture of the department so that instead of accepting misconduct, people were stepping forward to stop it before it happened. Uh, One wonderful, he was a sergeant, now he's a lieutenant, tells a story about how a guy was in handcuffs and spit right in his face. And he said, I, I lost my head and I reached back. My fist was clenched and I wanted to hit him. And a young officer tapped me on the shoulder and she said, take a step back. I got this. And he said, that person saved my career and maybe saved my freedom because I didn't do anything. I never committed an act of misconduct and wanting to is not a crime. And if, Believe me, if anybody spits in your face, you're going to want to hit them. Having somebody nearby who can step forward and be an active bystander and say, hey, do you really want to do this? Is this guy really worth your career? Is a good thing. So the New Orleans Police Department started to improve and people started to notice uh, in significant ways, citizen complaints against the department started to go down. Uh, Use of force allegations started to go down. Uh, Misconduct allegations started to go down. And the people in the department believed that EPIC was a big part of the reason for these improvements. So 
other departments started hearing about Epic. It was written up in a couple of, I think the New York Times did a story about it. And NOPD started to get requests for, can, can you share this with us? And they did. They tried to. They sent a few officers to a couple of departments. But there's no way that one city police department has the bandwidth to do this all over the country. So Jonathan Arany, who is uh, an attorney at the Shepard Mullen law firm, and Christy Lopez, who was the co-chair of what was then called the Innovative Policing Project. They've since changed their name. It's now called the Center for Innovations and Community Safety. And they decided to make a home for ABLE, and ABLE was born, the Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement. Joe, give me just one second. I just wanted to show the, um, the slide that you gave me so they can see what the logo looks like, okay? Yeah. Um, Oscar, por favor, pono tres. So that's the logo on the website. Um, and so plans started to be made, and uh, Abel hired a curriculum developer named Karen Rice, who is a genius. She's the best curriculum developer I've ever run into. And she turned, she took Epic and enhanced it in several important ways. One way is instead of just focusing on misconduct and mistakes, we added, there was a third pillar added, which was officer wellness. Because if officers aren't physically and mentally healthy, they're going to make more mistakes and commit more acts of misconduct. Healthy people are much better police officers than unhealthy people. So now Abel has, uh, and I think we have a slide for that, has a... We do. Oscar, for favor. Oscar, yo, yo no veo los slides, so tienes que dejarme saber. Slide four, por favor. And you'll see in a second that the, 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 the three pillars of ABLE are reduce mistakes, prevent misconduct, and promote officer wellness. Joel, are you seeing them? Yes. Okay. So, Oscar, baja lo porque yo no veo. So, so now this curriculum is really built around these three pillars and they're of equal size and equal importance to the folks at ABLE that are providing this. So the, all of us together, we're starting to put together this curriculum and was looking pretty good. And then George Floyd died. George Floyd was murdered. And suddenly, there was a, uh, let's just call it a, a window of opportunity. And you never know how long those windows are going to stay open. But police departments all over America started saying, wow, this could help. And if you remember watching on television when Derek Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's neck, there were three other officers there. And I don't know if you know this, but two of them were in their first week as a, as a police officer. Derek Chauvin was their field training officer. He had authority over them. You know, maybe I would love to say I have the courage to say no to my boss in my first week on the job or to intervene and say, get your knee off his neck but I can't say that for sure. And what I do know for sure is that those officers had never been trained in how to be an active bystander, how to intervene to prevent harm, not only harm to George Floyd, but ultimately harm to Derek Chauvin. He's in prison now. So a lot of departments started requesting access to this ABLE curriculum. And interestingly, because of COVID and the, and the lockdown, 
There was no way that live training could happen. And amazingly, because of this medium that we're on right now of Zoom, Zoom turned out to be a, a much better way to do business than I ever dreamed prior to the lockdown. And we started doing train the trainer sessions for tra police departments all over America. Um, I think we are just about 200 police departments. The, the slide that I gave you is from the website. It's not even caught up because we're doing usually three trainings uh, each month and they last all day Tuesday, all day Thursday and uh, uh, two hours on Monday and Wednesday. Joe, uh, you mean slide number six, the uh, uh, by the numbers? Yes. Um, Oscar, puedes poner el número seis. Joe, let me know when it's up because I'm not, I don't have a video. Oh, okay. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so, so that's why you said it's increased though. Yeah, we're up to, I think, 198 agencies, well over a thousand instructors that have tra been trained who now go back to their home agencies and provide training to their entire police department. Uh, we have police departments from 38 states. Yeah, that's uh, on slide five, Oscar del Cinco, slide five. No, it's the right, it's the right slide. It's, he's right. This is the right slide, Roy. Um, serving over 70 million citizens. Include, let me just give you a few examples of, of the police departments. And I think this is on slide cinco. Is New York City Police Department, NYPD. Right. Slide five, yeah. Boston Police Department, yes. Cinco, yes. So this is just some examples. So we've got NYPD, Boston, Philadelphia, Dallas, Denver, Seattle, Portland, Baltimore, the Harris County Sheriff's Office in Houston, or the Houston area, St. Louis County Sheriff's Office, and a host of smaller departments across the country. Uh, in New Jersey, Every single police officer in the state of New Jersey is now required to get ABLE training. It's taught at the FBI National Academy. Um, so these are all departments that have committed to becoming ABLE agencies. And there's, there's a whole bunch of things you have to do to become an ABLE agency. You cannot do this as window dressing. The department has to send in an application that includes uh, letters of support from community agencies. And there have been letters of support from all kinds of community agencies, churches, NAACP, Black Lives Matter, citizen organizations of all kinds saying, yeah, we believe that they're serious about this. The mayor or the county executive has to commit to it. The chief of police or the sheriff has to commit to it. They have to agree to train every single sworn officer in their department. Um, they have to make sure that their policies protect people who are active bystanders from any kind of retaliation. These are all things that are designed to get a police department or a sheriff's office to really invest in ABLE and not to be able to do this as window dressing to say, aren't we cool for doing this? Um, we know it's not going to change the culture of every department overnight. Everybody knows that. But we have seen a wonderful array of police trainers and sheriff's department trainers who have really bought into ABLE and what we're trying to accomplish. And basically what it is, is teaching people the science behind active bystandership. What are the inhibitors that prevent people from being active bystanders? How do you overcome those inhibitors? Why it works? And then how to do it? What are some strategies to use to overcome inhibitors? We show them how active bystandership has been used in the aviation industry to prevent tragedies, in operating rooms to prevent tragedies, 
on college campuses to prevent sexual assault uh, in a whole host of ways. So instead of saying, what, why us? Why are they teaching us to the, this to the police? We say, why not us? Why not the police department? You guys deserve this. You've had a duty to intervene for a long time, but no one's ever taught you how to do it. So now that's being fixed. Uh, NYPD, just for an example, has, I'm told, trained about half of their officers. They have 36,000 officers. And they're in the process of training every single sworn officer in the NYPD. And they're doing it fast. They're really working hard to get this done. Uh, the state of New Jersey is working really, really hard to get this done so that it, within a short period of time, every single police officer in the state of New Jersey is going to be trained in active bystandership with the ABLE curriculum. So that's sort of an explanation of what ABLE's up to. Uh, it's a wonderful group of people. So the, the, uh, uh, the person who runs the show is Lisa Kurtz. Jonathan Arany is the head of the advisory committee. Uh, Christy Lopez is the co-director of the, uh, what's now called the, the Center for Innovations in, in Community Safety. Um, to hear Duckett has come on board as the executive director, it's a really wonderful group of people. I'm a small part of it, but I have to tell you, in my very long career, this is the coolest thing I've ever been part of. It's an honor for me to be to play the small role I play. Uh, and any department that doesn't have this yet should. So if you're watching this and you're in the United States uh, and your police department, pick up the phone and call them, ask them if they're an able agency. And you have to enable say, them to be, you have to enable them <laughs> yeah. and if they say no ask them why they're not an able agency and why they haven't applied because it's it's either free for most agencies it's free training for training their trainers uh in the gigantic ones they have to pay a a, a, a reasonable amount of money because they're getting their own dedicated trainings but there's no good reason not to do this. It's a way to save the career of fellow officers. It's the way to save the lives of fellow officers. It's a way to reduce misconduct, reduce mistakes, keep yourself off the front page, and, and regain the trust that police departments should have with the communities that they serve and protect. So the, the NYPD uh, becoming able certified that that came after George Floyd. That's a question. Uh, you know what? I don't. I think so, but I don't remember exactly when they signed up or if they were on the waiting list before that. Uh, I don't remember that for sure. Okay. So, but I'm I'm going to guess that after George Floyd, it really picked up a lot of steam. Oh, absolutely. Departments all over the country. In fact, we've trained a, a number of departments in Canada also that have heard about ABLE and asked to be included. Um, but yeah, when, when George Floyd was killed and, you know, there was, you know, trouble in the streets and police departments uh, said, wow, this is, a, this is a solution. And don't think that it was wasted on them that those three people who are now still facing charges had never been trained in how to intervene and what to do in a situation like that. So, um, you know, certainly with, with um, helping to prevent police misconduct, there's obviously an assumption that the police are intervening in some way with society. <laughs> Somebody from society is doing something mm -hmm. there. There's a lawbreaker or a suspect or something's going on. Uh, so the, the 
a, a piece of what's what needs to be done obviously involves um training training police officers in in other areas you were we were talking about ethics uh but i did want to point out i wanted to ask oscar um por favor oscar pone 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 slide seven el numero siete and joel if you could just let me know when it's up sure Oh, okay. <laughs> now I'm seeing that. I was it's fine up. for a while. <laughs> All right. Um, community policing, basically, this is partnership between individuals and organizations mm -hmm. and police to look for solutions to solve problems the community face and increase trust. So it involves creating immersion. In other words, the police have to have some mm -hmm. way of emerging em during an immersion <laughs> into, into the community. Um, training not only in ethics, but you know, ethics would would also I think play a role when we're looking at diversity and cultural sensitivity training. Depending on where you are, you obviously need to understand the 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 cultural aspects of the community and uh, active listening. The active listening should should be should be something that you're 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 bouncing something back. A person says something to you. And with active listening, you say, okay, so I'm, I'm understanding that this is what happened to you. Am I correct? You're, you're getting feedback. It's like a bit of a dialogue and just not what, what did you see, what happened, and just jotting down short, short answers to questions and that's it. But it's more of a back and forth kind of a dialogue. It's a two-way street between police and the community, and by community, I mean individuals, organizations, anyone that the community, that the police will have interactions with. And the whole idea is that over a period of time, the police officers, they develop relations. But this I got a slide, Oscar. They develop relationships with the with the community, and the community says, well, you know, this is this is police officer so-and-so. Police officer says that, hi, Joel. You know, there's this more of that camaraderie that develops and that's also a way of um of increasing the trust so uh, i i know that uh that there i know that there are programs and it's that it's certainly a requirement uh to have something in the area of culture sensitivity there are probably other other aspects that i did not put in the slide but there's other areas of specialty police officers need to uh have special training if they're involved in domestic violence situations, domestic violence situation can escalate and be very dangerous, not only to the people or, or, or to whoever's involved in the domestic violence incident, but to police officers who show up. Uh, so there's specialty training uh, for that, you know, what, what types of questions to ask, how to intervene, again, the active, the active listening. And uh, there, there are obviously other uh, areas that are important. I'll mention no, another one, but it's for police officers who have to intervene with emotionally uh, upset, the what's called the emotionally disturbed person when they're dealing with somebody who's, who's really reacting. Uh, Joel, you and I, we had plenty of those kinds of uh, clients at Kirby, you know, that they would have encounters with police. And unfortunately, many of them, were, were uncomfortable and the police were not entirely sure how to how to intervene with them so that would be another area of uh, specialized training um joel and any anything to add to this uh, the community policing or diversity or ethics or special guess, kinds of training i guess the main thing i would add is that um one of the ways that you accomplish things in life is to have focus and we're pretty focused. So we get asked a lot, well, does does ABLE cover um, diversity training or bias training? And the answer is no, but if you have an ABLE agency, bias training is going to work way better. Because think about it, if, if, if two of us are trained um, to recognize implicit bias. 
but I'm in a scuffle with somebody and I lose my temper and all of a sudden my frontal lobe is clocked out and my lizard brain is taken over. I'm not thinking about, I'm not thinking as calmly as I ought to be, but you, you're not in the middle of it and you're right behind me and you say, Hey, Joel, I got this because maybe you're calmer. Right. And and your thinking brain is working better than your feeling brain, unlike me, because I've lost my cool. So that way, if one person's thinking about the training they've received and and all of the things that you mentioned, it's going to be more effective for the department. Uh, And that's why we we really stick to the bystander part of this but we think it supports almost every other kind of police training. We encourage agencies to build it into their firearms training, their report writing training. If somebody's about to write a report that isn't exactly accurate, to have somebody say, hey, maybe you should think about doing this right, not trying to cover anything up. So, any time, and that's why it's all three pillars or somebody who's maybe having trouble at home or maybe they're drinking a little too much or maybe they haven't been getting enough sleep so that another officer can step up and say, hey, I'm a little worried about you. You need to take care of yourself or maybe you need to talk to a psychologist like Dr. Aranda or maybe you need to go to the EAP program. So we really stress those three pillars, and it's all about avoiding harm or reducing harm or preventing harm. Uh, as as our one of our people who helped develop Epic in New Orleans, Ted Quant said, if there's there there's no story to tell because nothing happened. So th- those things are all really important. And a lot of police departments are doing multiple things at the same time to try to do better. Um, and, and some of them were doing it, have been doing it for a long time. So um, I guess I would just say that there are lots and millions of interactions with police that never go on the front page, never get on CNN because everything went fine. But when things go bad because police officers have so much power and so much responsibility, it tends to uh, create a, a, a negative image and destroy that trust that you were talking about between the police department and the community that it serves. So, Joel, the, the, the main way of really ascertaining success in the absence of people making a phone call to a police department and saying, I really appreciated what happened, which I'm guessing probably happens every now and then. But in the absence of that, you're looking in terms of statistics. You're looking at a decrease in incidents in reportable incidents or in things that make the news. And I'm wondering, is there, is there, have there been any statistical computations that have been done? Uh, I'm guessing that there must be so, to indicate success. How, how are you measuring success? So first, let me say one of the frustrations of my professional life is that uh, when your goal is to prevent things, you're all, it's always difficult to prove what did not happen because you can't say what would have happened if there hadn't have been an intervention. Secondly, we specifically don't ask departments to document interventions unless something reportable happened. So if the preventive intervention succeeded, there's nothing to report. So it's hard to count what didn't happen. So what you can do is you can look at things like citizen complaints. Did they go down? The problem is that departments that are um, becoming able agencies are almost always doing several things at the same time, trying to get better. So they're doing other kinds of training. They may be changing some policies and procedures based on an event that happened. They may have a 
a settlement agreement or a consent decree in a lawsuit. So like in New Orleans, can I say that everything got better because of Epic? I think it, but I can't say it as a scientist because there were a lot of things going on at the same time to, that the department was trying to do to improve itself. Um, so we have a research advisory committee that is working hard on this and trying to look at ways to measure officer perceptions, officer opinions and attitudes, what things to count, what things not to count. But it's going to be a while before we have the kind of data that you're talking about, Roy, where we could really say with some scientific um, certainty that this was effective. What we know so far is that the people that are being trained say they like it. They say they're going to use it. Um, but it's really difficult to prove what we've prevented because of the reasons that I just gave. I can, I can certainly understand um, the importance and need for having looked at methods to modify, correct, improve police misconduct is certainly, um, I mean, I, you know, I've been aware of this as an issue for quite some time. It became most salient after George Floyd. But what I'm wondering also um, is, it, has this model either been thought, thought of, thought about, or modified, uh, or given any sort of thought by uh, first first responders, uh, firefighters, other kinds of agencies that have contact with the with the public of uh, fire and ambulance, uh, EMS, and you know anywhere where where there could be areas of not doing things or cutting corners, and somebody says, "Hey, what are you doing?" We have a list, a waiting list of departments that's pretty challenging so we're going to stay focused on law enforcement for now could it, uh, would it be good for a fire department to have a version of able absolutely um we're getting requests from from europe now also we're we're really trying to stay focused because uh, our goal is for every police department in the United States that wants active bystandership training can get it. Um, so whether or not the future will hold some version of ABLE for other related professions, it's a great question that you're asking. But, you know, the way that the George Floyd's death came down and the timing uh, we started pretty quickly after that because we didn't want to lose that window of opportunity when people were really interested in, in change. Um, so I, it's at least at this stage, it's, it's very much premature, but I certainly wouldn't be surprised to see, it might not be able, but some version of active bystandership training that's, done as thoughtfully and professionally as able to to try to reach uh, those professions i mean it certainly sounds like like a wonderful platform it's it's uh, it provides with the you know a platform a methodology an idea uh that if followed should curtail um you know incidents or police you know incidents where there might be police misconduct um i think that the, the the platform can be built on as, as as you pointed out as well with other elements you know adding diversity and culture and working with emotionally disturbed people domestic violence situation um firing firing guns i mean you know like firing uh well, you know all you know all of this specialized training I, would I be addition I doubt, i'm sorry i i doubt that we're going to go in the direction of trying to add things to the platform uh, no, that, that's what i'm saying is that would be up to the police department the police uh, department that provides diversity and culture and training on ethnicity and different religions and all of that and uses the able 
platform is 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 more effective would be yeah so you're you're adding able you're 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 adding something to able able as the basic platform uh, yeah so they would have able and other things and they can certainly infuse able into those other kinds of training and that's already happening yeah um but but we're trying to really stay true to the to our mission and stay focused on on this piece of it but who yeah, knows you're, focus, you're, you're, you're focusing on and training the the basic core the platform I mean, we're we are very much not for profit. So if we if we were a, if we were a corporation trying to make money, we would have already diversified and franchised and and uh, uh, watered down our product. But we're we're staying really true to the mission. Okay. Um, I wanted also since I know that the viewers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that many of the viewers have had encounters with with police either via a traffic stop or or, or, or questioning on the street or for some other reason they have had encounters with police. Uh, so what I wanted to do is to offer the viewers and certainly those viewers who may be, uh, uh, you know, young, beginning beginning to drive or viewers who have. Uh, who have uh, their, their their kids are starting to drive, and you know when you're when you're younger, you take more risks, uh, you you take more chances. You're not that inclined to be aware of everything that's going on, or you think that that you know you know best sometimes. So um, what I wanted to do is to provide at least uh, a, a takeaway on how to how to make for safer safer traffic stops on those occasions that a viewer uh, might be stopped. And uh, towards that end, I have a slide. Oscar, por favor, el ocho. Y ya sabes que no lo veo. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so um, here enhancing, enhancing safety and traffic stops. And I just want, you know, the viewers to be aware that this is probably the single most risky or dangerous aspect of police work. Um, you know, a police officer goes to work, wants to go home, <laughs> you know, wants to go home, wants to be safe and go home that night. And, uh, and in a traffic stop, a police officer never knows. You, know, you, you have no idea who you're pulling over and what the nature of the stop might be, what that encounter might be what sort of risk might be. It's very easy to say that an assumption is that whoever you pull over will will comply and listen and there won't be a problem. Uh, but again, that's an assumption that you make and the police officer really doesn't know. So um, the first part of the equation is police, police themselves being prepared and knowing how to approach a vehicle. You know, so basically either either calling or calling for backup or waiting or timing the stop. Um, you know, there, there's things that they can do as well in order to maintain, um, you know, safety or increase safety, minimize risk. So that's certainly up to the police and the police department. The driver behavior, which is the part that I want to focus on, um, is assume that you're you're being you're being, you know, car behind you flashes the lights, a police car, uh, pull over when you're asked to stop as soon as you can. Uh, signal that you're planning to pull over and do pull over as soon as it is safe to do so. You're not going to take a mile, you know, to, to pull over. You know, you signal and you try to pull over as soon as you're able to. Uh, if it's dark, turn the lights on in the vehicle so that the officer can see you. If you're on the phone or you've been on the phone and you're talking, cut the phone call. If the radio's turned on, turn the radio off. You want to have no noise in the vehicle. If the um, engine, engine obviously it's running, turn it off. Turn it off. Police are going to feel a lot safer that you're not going to take off. If you have the engine running, it's off. You have to make the added move to start the engine again. So turn the, turn the engine off. Roll down the window. You know that you're going to be asked something, so don't wait for the knock on the window. Roll down the window. 
Um, keep your hands visible. I, I always suggest keeping the hands on the steering wheel so that the police officer can see both hands. If like for any reason you're moving a hand, just make sure that the hands are always in view. Uh, don't ask, wait, wait for the officer to tell you what it is that he wants you to do. He or she wants you to do. Wait to be told what to do. Don't argue. Don't ask questions. Don't say, what did I do? I didn't do anything. Just comply. The police officer, most likely than not, will ask you for some form of identification. That's logical. There's an expectation you'll have registration, insurance card, and a license. So try to keep those things in an area that's certainly accessible. Your license, of course, you'll have probably in your pocketbook or, 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 or your pocket and wallet. The uh, other things can be in a glove compartment. You know, keep them know where they are and keep them accessible. Uh, you're not going to argue. You're going to stay calm and remain polite. Um, very important that you do not make any sudden movements. Nothing quick. Ever, whatever movement you make is slow and you let the police officer know if you are going to move. If you ask for something, which likely you will, ask for permission. You say, um, I'm reaching, may I reach for my wallet? It's in my back pocket. I have the license and registration there. So ask for permission. Uh, don't exit the vehicle unless you're asked to. And if you are asked to exit the vehicle, do exit the vehicle. Uh, don't do anything until you're told. The police officer may take your information, go back to the squad car, um, type it in on the computer, see if there's any information on you, if you are who you say you are, if there's any warrants, if there's outstanding tickets, you know, maybe you will write up a ticket or so forth. It could be a couple of minutes. So you stay put in the car, light on, engine off. Uh, finally, when you're told you can leave, that would be the time to leave. Um, you're not going to argue then that you didn't do anything, that you didn't run the light, you didn't run, run the stop sign. Uh, you know, if you get a ticket and you need to challenge that, you're going to do that afterwards. That's not, that's not the time to do it and not with the police officer. What I'm telling you is really to safeguard you as a driver. And certainly if you have passengers with you, same thing applies to them. No sudden movements. They shouldn't walk out of the car unless they are told to. Uh, so this similar, similar for the passenger, passenger or passengers. Um, other things that may be a little bit more complicated if they're asked to search the vehicle. There are certain um, requirements, but it's um, it's lighter actually for uh, for a search than than you think. Uh, it's not it's not quite like somebody uh, wanting to search your house. So um, that said, boy, this I got a slide. And Joel, did you have anything to to add to this? It's basically I just wanted to keep um, <laughs> the people stopped. <laughs> I wanted to keep the public and cops safe. So that was my main purpose for putting that slide up. Anything to add to that? No, I think focus. And if you just think of the officer as a person, and it's not in your interest or their interest for them to be afraid that you're going to hurt them, they're much less likely to hurt you. So if, if everybody stays calm, then there's much less chance of anything bad happening. Chances are you may even end up with just a warning. You know, like your light's broken, get it fixed. <laughs> I mean, you, you don't know what you're being stopped for. So the odds are if you're polite and, 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 you know, you do everything sort of as I suggested. You, you may you may not get a ticket. You may just get a you know be be more careful or drive more slowly. Uh, there's there's a lot of discretion that cops have when they make the stops. So be be aware of that, and it'll <laughs> certainly be more to your comfort. Um, I want to put up slide nine, uh, Joel, which deals with resources, and I have you there as well. Por favor, Oscar El Nueve. There it is. Okay, so um, my, my business card is on the left, as usual. I have, like, my consultant, Peter Canaris, uh, on the right. And this is how we are reachable. Uh, I, I have Joel. I have you with your website. I just wanted to encourage people 
uh, to look at it, to, to, to more or less not only see your, your bio, but the kinds of things that you've done and the areas that you've worked in. And, uh, you know, I think it's a very nicely developed uh, website. So I encourage the viewers to take a look at it. Uh, New York State Psychological Association, uh, I've promoted them uh, before. I'll continue to do that. I've provided you with their with their phone and contact information as well. New York State Psychological Association is the um, premier psychological association of New York State, and it's uh, under the American Psychological Association, which is underneath it. The APA is the parent uh, association of all of the state associations and provinces. So NISPA, uh, New Jersey Psychological Association, um, Joel, where you are, you know, there, there's a psychological association for the state as well. So people, uh, you know, viewers, regardless of whatever state you are, just just if you need to look up the state association, you'll find out that there are a lot of wonderful resources. You may have contact information to get particular providers of services that interest you. There may be information uh, about presentations and workshops and things that are happening, uh, the impact of COVID or responses to what's going on in society. All of that could very well be up on those sites. Uh, Suffolk County Psychological Association, that's the, uh, the my, my regional, that's uh, that I live in Suffolk County, so that's my regional psychological association. I'm in Suffolk and I've given you their information as well. So um, they, they have, Suffolk County Psychological Association has a lot of wonderful uh, resources. So I encourage you to, to take a look um, at that if you get a chance. Oscar, por favor, puede sacar el slide, uh, por favor. Okay, so um, Joel, we're wrapping up. I just wanted to, to ask you, I wanted us, uh, first, I wanted to thank you so much. I, I owe you a debt of gratitude back to back two weeks apart now. I uh, wanted to thank you for being available. I think that this provides an area that's very interesting for the, for the viewers. You know, I'm sure that many of the viewers probably do have some relationship with, with law enforcement, um, or, or they have family that's interested in becoming police officers or, or, or some other branch of law enforcement. So I'm sure that it's important for them to know this. Uh, and I also think it's important for the viewers to know how important, how necessary it is for them to work on developing healthy uh, interactions with police. So we've gone over quite a bit. So Joel, any, any parting comments for, for the viewers? No, they're except that they're all hiring. So if you're looking for a great career, think about being a police officer. They're, the departments are hiring all over the United States right now. It's a great job. They, 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 they sure are, and, and I've been involved in that. <laughs> I've been involved in doing screenings of, you know, to, to see if uh, police officers could be hired. And I've also been involved in doing screenings for candidates who've had a difficulty getting past the the psychological uh part so um you know i've been i've been involved in that and i've met many many uh, many wonderful people um don oscar any any parting comments from you okay oscar's telling everybody be safe try not to get stopped <laughs> stick to the speed limit <laughs> you know joel it's my is it is it just my impression or because of the pandemic, people are driving a little bit more aggressively or something, or am, am I imagining it or, or, or did That's, the pandemic somehow, somehow I, do something? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> here, here in New York, I see people and my, my patients are telling me, oh my God, you know, like, is this more, more risk taking on the highway? So be, be careful, be careful. To all my viewers, be be safe out there. Be careful when you do drive. Be careful by, by the loss of the road. Um, I do hope that you enjoyed the program. Uh, certainly, um, I always admonish you. I, not admonish you, but I always encourage you to be on the lookout uh, for your, of your neighbor. Be aware. Make sure your neighbor's okay and safe. 
Um, the community, same thing. Be prepared to look out for one another. And uh, thank you for joining us today. We will have uh, another show. I have several other shows lined up in, in the planning uh, for November. So again, Oscar, thank you for being a producer. Joel, thank you once again. I think it's a very, very, very important topic. So I really wanted to emphasize that to my viewers. This is something, anything involving our interactions with police is probably one of the most important things we go through in our lives. So thank you once again for being a guest. My viewers, thank you. Be safe. And hasta la vista. We'll see you uh, in November. Okay. Buenas noches. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody.